Hey, welcome to The Uplift. I'm Tony DeCopo. Coming up on this show, a Bronx dad who has served the homeless for 44 years and is now doing even more to help those in need. And by day, he's a police officer, but also a classically trained violinist who's using his free time to serve others through music. Plus, the man who overcame the odds to walk at his own graduation ceremony and two Air Force captains who found friendship because of what makes them different. All that plus our most viral videos of the week. You're watching The Uplift. Hey there, welcome to The Uplift. It's a show that lifts you up. Oh, doesn't that feel good, at least for the next 30 minutes? And we're going to start with Marty Rogers, who has always looked out for his Bronx community. He's a father of three who has fed the homeless every Thanksgiving for 44 years. And then last year, when the pandemic hit, he decided not to do less, but to do more. Caitlin O'Kane has his story. Marty Rogers has been feeding the homeless for 44 years. Every Thanksgiving, Marty organizes a dinner for those in need at his Bronx church, Immaculate Conception. In recent years, the father of three decided to take his meals on the road and walk around the South Bronx, giving out sandwiches to those in need. He calls them Hope Walks. Marty and volunteers, including kids from the Bronx and Harlem, used to go on the Hope Walks a few times a year. But when the pandemic hit and many things shut down, they ramped up. No one is out. Everyone's quarantining. But who is out is more and more people who are homeless. Now it's staring us really in the face. And we had the conversation and we started going out once a week with our supplies. And then we said, this has to be more. And we went three times a week. Each week, Marty and his volunteers make sandwiches with money donated from the community. Then they take their homemade PB&Js and turkey sandwiches, and they set out to ask people if they'd like some food. Our neighborhood has a lot of people who are homeless. We insist that it's people who are homeless. They're not homeless people. They're, some of the people are seniors. Some of the people may have addiction issues. We don't ask. It's none of our business. It's non-judgmental. But we do know this about them. Many of them are, they're all on the margins. And they all will benefit from a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a bottle of water, a hat or a pair of gloves, um, and a cookie. And then we always end with a little prayer and a blessing. It's simple, but Marty has seen firsthand the impact of the Hope Walks. One of our ladies last year, Virginia, we saw her on the on outside. And, she goes, I got an apartment. We were so thrilled. <laughs> you didn't help her do it, but I mean, maybe we play a small part. We are some people that at least she can sh share that good news with, and we definitely celebrate with her. We were with Marty when he went on a Hope Walk with kids from Immaculate Conception School, and it was clear the hope went both ways. Alexander Strawn is a police officer by profession, but his passion is actually music. Jan Crawford reports now on this classically trained violinist who found a way to bridge his badge and his violin to serve his community. At practice, you can hear the talent. Not surprising, considering Alexander Strawn has been playing violin since he was a kid. When I was 10 years old and my mom, surprise, surprise, wouldn't let me play the drums, that was my first pick. What might be surprising, given this talent, is his day job. I'm police officer Strawn. Strawn is a cop in Prince George's there? County, Maryland. I think it throws people for a leap because they're thinking, wait a second, why is there an officer here? What are you carrying? Oh, you're here to play. And well, you don't really see, you know, cops, uh, you know, in uniform playing a violin. No. I mean, that's just not something you see every day. Uh, not at all. <laughs> Strong sees the violin as a way for people, especially seniors, to find connections. It makes it feel like it's a warm, welcoming environment, that we're all family, and the music brings us together. 
those simple notes unlock powerful memories for those senior citizens. It was in high school he started playing for people in assisted living facilities and in hospice. After studying music in college, Strawn traveled the world on a mission with music for healing. That all stopped with COVID, so Strawn put down the violin for the badge. It seems so different. You're, you're, you're a violinist and now you're a police officer. The situations we go in are arguably sometimes the, the worst of someone's day. And when I played for in hospice, those moments that I was part of, it's arguably probably the worst that that person's had experience. Being able to play for people in those situations has helped prepare me for the grittiness of the job. How so? Because it's a hard moment to play for someone and their family surrounding them and they pass away. So you really haven't traded in the violin for the weapon. Right. You found a way to carry both. Exactly. He saw the power of music while playing for his grandmother, who suffered from Alzheimer's. When I played for her, she would sing, See? sometimes cry. One of her favorites, Amazing Grace. something she recognized. Yeah, something she recognized. It's almost like the fog of all, all time is lifted and she's able to see again. And then the disease took her right back. And it's... But you had those, that's so moving. Right. You had those moments with her. I did. Now, playing in uniform, Strawn hopes people will see officers as more than a gun and a badge. I think it shows that uh, you can be unique too. Um, there are cops of plenty of talents. And you know, I'm surrounded by talent within my squad, department, station, and people don't see that. And you know, I hope that me playing the violin, it enables people to see a different side of police officers. I'm still working at getting better as a violinist. But now I have the gun and badge, and I'm trying everything I can to serve the community. Serving and performing with a purpose. Thank you. Want to clap along with them. What you do for a living is not all you are. Turns out Officer Strong there is a pretty good musician, doing wonderful things with that music as well. Our next story is about walking down the street in Laguna Beach, where you might see a little something in the cracks of the sidewalk. Don't be alarmed. It's artwork drawn with chalk and charcoal, charcoal by David Zinn. Jamie Yukis now takes us on a tour of his creative creations. What do you look for? What's a canvas on the street? Oh, anything. To uh, most people, even. this might look like an ordinary street. But to David Zinn, it offers endless possibilities. There's strange little posts in the ground. Sometimes no one can tell me why they're there, so they might be there for this person, you know? Just, just for you for to me. start drawing. Yeah, maybe, who knows? For more than 20 years, the Michigan native worked as a freelance commercial artist until a box of colorful sidewalk chalk convinced him to leave his day job. Oh, but that is a squirrel's tail. The 52-year-old now creates whimsical 3D drawings right on the spot using everything from manhole covers to weeds and street cracks as his inspiration. A few minutes ago, this was just a, a patch, and it wanted to be a hole in the ground. Yeah, uh, it's still a hole in the ground, yeah. yeah. So it's working? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you decide to start doing art with chalk, of all things? The honest answer is that I was looking for an excuse to be outside on a nice day. That was how it started. That's it? Um, yeah. We all seem to have chalk in our house. It's just very easy to come by, which is one of the things that I think makes it a good thing to make art with because it's not precious. Philomena, the flying pig, is just one of the characters that often pops up. There was, and is, <laughs> one perfectly flat small brick right here that is perfect for a pig head. So that's where the pig had to go. And yep. this is where the window ledge had to go because it couldn't go anywhere else. So what kind of chalk do you use? Anything I can get my hands on. It doesn't take long for Zinn to attract a crowd. From longtime fans... Look at me. I always get tears in my eyes when I see it. I just love it. It just makes me so happy. 
to first-time onlookers. He was like checking out the concrete over there, the concrete over here. It's like, what's going on? I've never seen anyone doing this before. The ground was perfectly dry. If Zinn isn't striking up conversations with real people, is that what you want to be? He can often be seen talking to the characters he's bringing to life. Where are your arms? I loved how he kind of explained his personal thought and his personal connection to it, which made me really feel like this really comes from his heart. This stuff isn't pre-planned. It's definitely from the heart. And I think he might be done. Still, even the most heartfelt piece of art can get washed away with just a few raindrops. But Zinn says that's all, well, part of the draw. Famous works of art hanging in museums get seen by thousands of people every day. But this, you could be in among the dozens of people who get to see this while it exists. That's pretty special. Is there a lesson in all this for people? <laughs> I hope so. I think that's part of what this is meant to do, to celebrate the fact that we walk through spaces on our way to somewhere else all the time and don't really take the time to notice where we are. And it's helped me a lot to actually appreciate every single place that I am for what it can do. Yeah, that'll do, at least until it rains. Check the weather. Hope it doesn't rain anytime soon. Those are really wonderful pieces of art. Our next story is about Aldo Almenta, a student at Florida International University who was paralyzed in an accident about five years ago. Uh, but that accident did not stop him from conquering his goals. He went on to earn a master's degree in biomedical engineering. And at his graduation ceremony, Aldo not only accepted his diploma, he walked across the stage to receive it using what's known as an exoskeleton. He says no matter what your background, your condition, or your age, anything is possible, and he's proven it. Well done. Coming up, the woman who broke a world record by running 95 marathons in 95 days, and the powerful reason why she did it. Plus, the friends who call themselves an odd couple, even though they're actually very similar. You're watching The Uplift. When the pandemic hit and our routines were shattered, Alyssa Clark found a new routine in running, and she ran a lot, eventually completing 95 marathons in as many days. Clark is now a world record holder as a result, and Caitlin O'Kane spoke to her about, I mean, it's a grand accomplishment, and how inspiring it is to others. When the pandemic hit and lockdowns were put in place, some people baked bread, some did puzzles, Alyssa Clark ran, and ran, and ran. Alyssa is an ultra marathoner who had signed up for several races in 2020. Each one ended up getting canceled. She had trained hard and didn't want to lose the fitness and motivation. So she decided to keep running marathons, one a day. It just kind of became a part of my everyday routine. Um, and with COVID, there was so much kind of disrupted by the everyday routine that I think the marathons um, really gave me structure to my day. They gave me a good purpose. Alyssa's husband is in the Navy and the couple lived in Italy where he was stationed. During the pandemic, they were moved back to the US. So Alyssa's life was shaken up again. The marathons became a way to bridge that and for me to continue, I think, having um, some kind of stability and some um, routine in my life. Alyssa kept up her marathons even during the transcontinental move. They first stopped in Germany and she ran a marathon on a treadmill overnight. Then they made several stops in the US where she of course made more time for more daily marathons. And then they ended in Panama City, Florida where Alyssa still kept running marathons even though she had already surpassed the world record with 61 marathons in 61 days. I was just on cloud nine, I was so happy. It was actually really hard to stop the marathons um, because I had grown, I mean, they were like a, a weird friend. I, it was just a companion. Quite a bit of the reason why I kept going is that I, I really wasn't sure what was on the other side of stopping. Um, which sounds kind of silly, but also it's like the, the known is sometimes a lot easier to keep than the unknown, especially when you're facing a lot of unknown. 
she ended up running 95 marathons in 95 days and a year later was recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records. She has many friends, snicker bars, and audiobooks to thank. Alyssa is still running strong, focusing on competing in ultra marathons again. A big part of my identity as a runner is encouraging um, women to go after like these big challenges and um, to encourage them with, like take on the men's record, take on um, these challenges that may not seem the easiest. Alyssa says no matter what feat you're trying to accomplish, just take it one step at a time. 95 marathons in 95 days is a lot of marathons. The record was 61. She kept going, went all the way to 95. I don't even know why she stopped at 96. I can't think of anything I could do for that long, so count me inspired. All right, our next story is a moving speech from an unlikely coach, a six-year-old named Cal, who entered a contest to join the staff of the Peterborough Pete's hockey team. That's in Canada. He wrote a powerful pep talk that caught the team's attention, and they actually invited Cal to a game so he could deliver the speech in person and pump up the players in their locker room. Take a look. Here we go. Legends are made every day, and you could be one of the greats. You were the chosen one. You were the years in the making. So today, we work hard, get back hard, shoot hard, spread out, pass hard. So get in there. That's your part. Love the points, love the message, love the emphasis. My only tip would be don't begin with, okay, here we go. Just go for it, Cal. You got this. All right, next time. Coming up, the two Air Force captains who bonded over their different religions, plus our most uplifting videos of the week. You love those. Do stick around. Now to our most heartwarming videos of the week. Video number one shows a dad in Utah just casually opening up his trunk and what he saw inside brought him to tears. It was one of his daughters who had lived in Switzerland for 12 years, decided to book a flight and surprise her family. Dad couldn't believe it. The only good news to come from a daughter locked in a trunk. Next, we go to Texas, where students at Franklin High School knew that their teacher, Mr. Dutton, loved his sneakers, particularly Air Jordan. So when they noticed that his were getting a little scuffed up, they surprised him with a gift that absolutely overwhelmed him. He actually asked them if they were lying, but they were not. Take a look. <laughs> no, you're lying. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. They did. They bought him a pair of Nikes and surprised him. Those aren't cheap, people. <laughs> All right, bring your kids to work day looked a little bit different for an eight-year-old girl in South Carolina. She got to play a very big role in her dad's last day in the military. That's her there on the tarmac, a little bit of coaching as she marshaled in his final flight before he retired after 20 years. Oh, it's powerful stuff. Three-year-old Waylon was a patient at Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital and he needed a heart transplant. And five months after arriving at the hospital, he got one. But here's the thing, Waylon didn't just walk into the surgery, he danced into the surgery. The hospital said it was nothing but smiles all the way. That is a brave, brave, brave little boy. Better dancer than me. Who isn't? Coming up, the friendship between two Air Force captains who say they are recognized as an odd couple, but they have much more in common than meets the eye. You're watching The Uplift. These two Air Force lawyers may seem pretty different, at least on the surface. He's Jewish, wears a yarmulke, she's Muslim, wears a hijab. But religion is actually what brought them together and bonded them very, very tightly. They're not hoping that their friendship is an inspiration to others. And I gotta say, it definitely is. Caitlin O'Kane has their story. Captain Joe Hawkeiser had recently joined the Air Force when his boss came to him with a question. And he's like, I just met a great candidate. And I said, okay, well, tell me about her. He's like, you can actually help her. She really wants to join, but she wears a hijab. You wear a yarmulke. Uh, can you help her 
process for religious accommodation. Captain Mesa Uza, who like Hawkheiser is a lawyer, knew she could wear a hijab once she was accepted into the Air Force, but there had not been any religious accommodations for officer training. So what that meant is that I would essentially be forced to choose between representing my faith or serving my country. And um, I felt conflicted because I, I identify as a Muslim American and I wanted nothing more than to serve my country. Uza made history, challenging the policy so that she could apply for religious accommodations before officially joining the Air Force. The Air Force ended up changing their policy altogether. I did not think that I would be making history, but I it usually change usually starts with one person. So I felt like I could create change, and I felt like if I joined, then I would pave the way for others to join me. Hawkeyser later learned about Uza's policy change on the news, and remembering her as the young recruit he heard about, he reached out on Facebook. The two became friends, and for the past year, they've been stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base together. When Joe, who is a reservist, is at the legal office, the two friends hang out. We've exercised her in her full hijab, me running with my yarmulke. Uh, we definitely make an odd couple, and uh, we love it. We love when people give us that double look, like, are you two really? Like walking together? Like, yeah, and we're friends. They even make TikToks together, where they get recognized not just for their differences, but their similarities. We are human. We we have, you know, we have the same organs, we have the same emotions, and yes, again, we have some differences, but at the end of the day, I I am sure that if you, if you if you really took the time to get to know someone, that you you might recognize that you have a lot more in common than you thought. Hawkeiser said Uza stays true to herself, and that's what he likes about her. She's kick-ass. I mean, that's the only way really to describe her. She is that role model that I want my daughter to look up to. Love that story. Hope you loved our show. Hope it brightened your day and lifted you up. And if it didn't, watch it again. Don't call me in the morning.